great question. Q and A. And uh, yep, perfect. Wonderful. Okay, and students are dropping in now. Welcome everybody to welcome, week 10, welcome. 61C. Well, it looks like at least some people have power. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, I don't. Uh, I, I, I <laughs> I'm in my uh, quarry office. I mean, this picture is fake, but uh, behind me, uh, it, it is fake, but it's almost real, almost real. Um, I'm actually, I made it to campus because there is no power at my home. Um, we have a limited amount of time. We have something really, really, really special um, today. So we're gonna get going to that. Um, we have a CTO, uh, our, uh, a well-known person in uh, in industry, which is Mark Papermaster from AD. Um, it will tell us a uh, uh, key story, how to solve big problems and have fun in the next 20 minutes. And, and then you know, feel free to type some questions. Um, and and uh, we have uh, um, two, uh, a corporate fellow, uh, Mike Clark, and a senior fellow, Tom Bird, who can help um, field some questions afterwards. Um, Mark, take it over. Very good, uh, Dr. Nikolic, uh, thanks for having me uh, join your class today. And uh, it will be quick. I'm gonna kind of go uh, through a little material, but it uh, really is about uh, engineering and about, I've been, uh, you know, old guy here, been uh, 35 plus years in the industry. So I'm just gonna jump in and just give you some uh, thoughts and uh, sh share with you, uh, you know, just some of the experiences I've had. So, so you know, it'll be a little mix of, uh, of things here. Bear with me as I, just get my uh, my uh, bearings here. I'm addressing the slides here in in Zoom. But look, um, time goes by by pretty quickly when you're having fun. So the first thing I'll tell you is, uh, as you're in your studies and you're deciding, you know, what do you want to do in industry? What do you want to do in academia? Uh, is uh, the the biggest thing I'd say is it's it's fun to solve problems. When you're solving problems, 35 plus years can go by pretty quickly uh, because it really is fun. And I've had a chance over those years, I've been primarily at IBM, uh, giving an example uh, of IBM, one of Apple and one of uh, the last nine years so I've been CTO and uh, running uh, technology and engineering at AMD. So a few examples of how you can both work really hard and have a lot of fun. So a start, you know, look at this photo of uh, that I'm showing there. It's the, it's an IBM, supercomputer as part of what's called the strategic uh, uh, Excel accelerated strategic compute initiative where rather than blowing up atomic bombs uh, you know the the intent was uh, to stop that practice that was going on across the world and simulate them uh, and so we uh, created a, a supercomputer uh, and you know it's it's a, a pretty amazing uh, that this was uh, you know, 10 teraflops of, <laughs> of computing. So it took a lot of chips and a lot of uh, systems uh, to, to create, uh, you know, this type of, uh, of uh, computing uh, back then. And so it, uh, it was a lot of fun though, because uh, we really had to boost the performance and, um, and really uh, think about problem solving at scale, how to, how to scale out. So, uh, it was really, uh, really brought the team together very, very closely, and uh, we solved some tough problems. In fact, uh, this this particular one called ASCII White uh, was the first use of copper interconnect. So it, it, it was not only the designing of the a computer chip, but how to use new materials, and and that's quite common in the chip design industry. You think, well, I can just work on one aspect of it, but not true. Uh, it's it's really getting you know many disciplines uh, uh, together, and um, and you know that uh, after some years I, uh, at, at IBM, I uh, took the job running uh, iPod and iPhone at uh, Apple, and you know that uh, also showed me uh, the incredible power of collaboration. Uh, because you, in fact, you look at the new iPhone that just launched, a lot of similarities to this iPhone 4 when it came out, 
It had retina display. It had glass front and back. It had uh, you know CNC uh, around the you know metal band on the on the entire periphery. Uh, it was the first uh, introduction of FaceTime. It was you know a, a, a new high resolution camera. So new, 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 and a new hardware and software stack. Uh, and so it really took a phenomenal uh, collaboration on the goal. Everyone focused on what's the end goal and working all the way through, not just the internal engineering teams, but just like that last I example I gave you, all the way through uh, the supply chain and, and the manufacturing side. And so it's one of the things I, I highlight is, uh, you know, solving, uh, solving tough problems really means, uh, you know, coming together and an anticipating uh, really uh, what the use case will be, you know, and how you, you have, uh, you know, the, an end product that uh, really is great and changes experience. Uh, so iPhone, uh, iPhone 4 was certainly a, a great example there and, uh, you know, really uh, exciting program. And, you know, it brings me to, uh, to Zen. So uh, you, you have uh, Tom and, and uh, Mike uh, on, the, on this call who are chief uh, architects at Mike is our chief CPU architect at the company, and uh, they can tell you a lot about what we've done with Zen, and we couldn't be more proud with uh, launching our third generation of Zen, uh, which is uh, we just announced, and then we begin uh, shipping it in just uh, another week and a half. Uh, so very, very exciting time for us. But that was another huge challenge. I mean, that was, um, you know, you, you got to call a problem uh, very candidly, and our problem was uh, we had let our single thread performance slip. So the team rallied together and set the, the goal of, of getting uh, AMD back to performance leadership. Uh, and it took, you know, really setting that right goal, uh, really defining, you know, what are the, um, you know, the knobs to, to get there uh, and, and uh, you know, delivering that. And so we did that in 2017 with the first generation of Zen. Uh, and uh, and I'll, I'll talk in a minute uh, a little bit more detail about the Zen 3 uh, that we just went out. But you know, again, each each one of these stories, uh, it's not where one person just went off in a corner and could just innovate and come out with something that created a great product. Uh, really, is about teams uh, working together, uh, solving problems together, uh, and making a big difference. And uh, you know, from our standpoint at AMD, we've got to stay on that uh, because uh, you know, you look at the trend of uh, GPU and CPU performance; it's been doubling about every two plus years. And that must continue. The demand for more computing is insatiable. Uh, and we don't get the lift on every semiconductor process node that we used to. The transistors really aren't getting faster. Some of the circuits aren't scaling as you go node to node. Uh, and frankly, they're more expensive per transistor. So it's a, just a phenomenal time for innovation. Because you know, anytime someone says, oh, because of this factor, or that factor, uh, you know, uh, the performance gains are going to stop. They're just wrong. Anytime you hear that, uh, you can just say, look at the history. There's always been innovation uh, that keeps us driving forward uh, and, and providing more and more performance. Uh, and, and certainly, in, in as far as I can see, uh, I, I see uh, there's just no end in sight as to how we're going to stay on this curve. So let's take a minute and just talk about graphics, rendering graphics. I mean, it's you know, when, you, when you're drawing a, a triangle, uh, it turns out there's a phenomenal amount of, uh, of computing because you're, uh, you're rendering, upon, you know, uh, billions and billions <laughs> of, these, of these triangles uh, to make incredibly um, resolute images. I mean, the whole idea of any of us that are involved in graphics development is we want it lifelike. We want it, we don't want you to know it was even a rendered image. Uh, and I just show you the example of, you know, connecting your studies to, um, you know, to having that impact. You, 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 in your curriculum, you probably had to take the linear algebra and, and, and a lot of the, uh, the, the math. Math is the language of what we do as engineers. Uh, and you, you couldn't see that more across, you know, all of what we do to give you that beautiful uh, visualization that we focus on in our discrete graphics products. Uh, whether anything from uh, rasterization to uh, the geometries you're drawing, uh, you know, rendering and, and uh, right up to and including uh, ray trace, uh, which will be, I'll show you an example in just a minute of our latest in ray tracing, uh, incredibly lifelike uh, images when you apply the math uh, and, and, uh, and you combine it with incredibly high performance computing. So with that, I said I'd show you a little example. Let me, uh, 
Uh, see if I can get this to uh, to roll here. So I'll stop it there, but it, it, we worked uh, very closely with the uh, teams on uh, on Terminator and the new the newest uh, edition of the Terminator series. And what they what was out there just couldn't get them the kind of uh, you know images they want. And I just show you this in the trailer because of course it it shows you how you uh, truly break down uh, these images. But it, it's a game changer with the kind of CPU and GPU performance. Uh, that we're able to deliver now. And what, what you're seeing on movies like this uh, is the whole set's changed. It, it it's, uh, used to be that you would film on traditional media and then you would cut and, and you would then do another take. And, and this editing process, this post-processing uh, was incredibly laborious. And frankly, the directors uh, you know, didn't always know they could even get the right scene. Uh, that has just totally changed. This is all done real time. The processing's done real time. Uh, the editing can be done uh, real time. Uh, so the, the kind of uh, performance that we've been able to uh, bring is is uh, a truly uh, truly changing uh, how uh, the media and entertainment uh, sector is uh, going about delivering their product. Really exciting. So, uh, you know, just another uh, example of that, and uh, that last example didn't have ray trace, and I didn't have time to show you my ray trace uh, example, but guess what? Uh, because we have our, our, uh, our technology in the new game consoles coming out uh, with um, Microsoft uh, Xbox Series X and S and uh, PlayStation 5, uh, their uh, pre-orders are out there, and I, I know uh, our family is a, a big gaming family, so I've got a couple members of my family uh, very excited about this uh, because it does it does have incredibly realistic imaging, uh, including hardware ray trace, which is you know just uh, it, it's amazing. Think about it. The games that you played, oh my God, I think about just eight years ago. Like you know uh, you know the uh, players would be wearing skull caps. Why? Because the physics of calculating the flow of the hair as the wind blew. You know, we couldn't even render it without it looking very choppy. And so the game uh, producers had, you know, again, had those skull caps. Now, of course, we model those physics. You see the hair, you see flowing robe, you see whatever on that, uh, that, that uh, imagery that they're trying to share. And now with Harbor Ray Trace, uh, it's just incredibly uh, realistic as the shadows and the light, uh, in fact, truly mimic the mass of uh, real light bouncing around in our day-to-day -day lives. Very exciting. Uh, now shift over to CPU computation. I, I uh, this has been you know just uh, near and dear to me. I started uh, you know way back on RISC uh, processors uh, uh, so many years ago, and uh, it's just been uh, phenomenal uh, to, to watch the development and and uh, and been such a pleasure to work with a, a, a brilliant uh, AMD uh, team the last uh, over nine years. Uh, and so you know one of the things that uh, I always uh, highlight to folks is um, you don't. You don't get lucky in this business of high performance. You you design your way to high performance. You have to uh, really spend a lot of time on the high level design. If you look at this uh, uh, Zen three that uh, that we just uh, you know announced and we just begin shipping uh, shortly here, you know I uh, I would always love to just stop by the engineer's office uh, when they were back at the early ideation phase. We call it the you know pre high level design. And on the whiteboard would be idea after idea that could drive performance. And of course, um, you know, about half of them don't work, but that's, that's what a good design is about. It's about trying things and accepting failure, accepting that uh, by no means will all of your approaches and all of your ideas work uh, and throwing out the ones that don't work and moving on uh, and, you know, uh, really testing the feasibility. And then, then when you really have analyzed that design and know you have a winner, then move it in to the phase where you implement, you do the logic circuit design, the verification and the, and the uh, validation. You know, uh, when you're done, it just has to work. Uh, the mass set with what we're at in these advanced technology nodes is over $15 million per mass set. So 
that decision to say, hey, I think I got it. Let's go build this. That's a $15 million decision on top, on top of all the years of work that uh, led up to completing that design. So, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, can't emphasize enough uh, the criticality of uh, the design, what it is you're studying and how to be rigorous in the application uh, to come up with great designs and uh, leadership designs. Uh, so that is what we did with Zen 3. Uh, you know, uh, if we if there's time later, uh, uh, Mike and Tom can uh, answer uh, more detailed uh, questions. Yeah, but just to give you have a sense. Uh, you know, what did we do? We were, were coming off of uh, two very impressive uh, designs that drove uh, with Zen 1, a 52% improvement of instruction per clock, uh, then another 15% uh, improvement uh, with Zen 2. And so to, to drive yet you know, another double digit performance improvement, uh, you know, it really was going across, you know, a, a broad range of, of levers, uh, really, you know, uh, how, you, how you can bring memory in closer to your compute elements critical. Uh, so, uh, you know, improving the latency was key, particularly on, on gaming. Games tend to have a dominant thread and that dominant thread, uh, when you can lower the latency, uh, just, uh, you know, obviously it, it's spending less time uh, waiting for the uh, for the data, and you just you see it, you uh, experience that. So uh, when uh, we doubled uh, actually the accessible L3 cache, uh, and and so we uh, reorganized how the cor uh, cores were laid out. Uh, that along with you know really uh, a number of uh, other elements across the load store unit, improving that, improving our our prefetch. Um, uh, you know it's, we always think about it in terms of a balanced computer. So as you widen out, uh, you know, an issue rate as we did across our floating point uh, and our integer engines, uh, we had to make sure uh, that we, you know, not only did we bring uh, data in closer with lowering uh, latency, uh, but we wanted more efficient uh, branch prediction. Uh, and so really uh, pleased with, uh, you know, really a, a zero wait time uh, in, in uh, we call zero bubble. Uh, it's really improving uh, how we uh, predict uh, the next construction. Uh, and, and keep a flow of data processing through our execution units. Uh, so we're, uh, we're, we can't let up. Uh, it's a very competitive industry we're in. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to stay on this very uh, strong uh, pace of performance improvement. And it's got to be energy efficient. Uh, uh, Tom Bird would be uh, disappointed if I didn't mention uh, as well how we focus equally on the physical implementation uh, because we're power limited in everything we do. And so... <laughs> What we were able to do with Zen 3 is pretty amazing because that 19% instruction per clock uh, was in the same technology node we had been in with Zen 2, uh, and we did not raise the uh, power uh, per socket uh, that we had. So uh, really quite an amazing, uh, amazing feat by the team. Uh, and then uh, wrap it up with my last section uh, because I know we're, we're, I just have a few minutes here, but supercomputing. Uh, I, I've been in, involved, as you saw from that, <laughs> from that slide I showed at the beginning of of the, uh, the big Department of Energy uh, uh, computer. Uh, and it, it uh, is incredible, uh, you know, how we have driven what, uh, is like my example before, uh, the teraflops that used to, to fill a room uh, into, uh, you know, a single chip. So this is our, our Radeon 5700, our Navi design uh, with 5.4 teraflops of peak double precision. So GPU is, is critical for that rasterization and that content creation that I showed you earlier, and equally critical uh, to be paired with CPU uh, and drive uh, incredibly dense floating point computation. I mean, GPU is the most flexible and easier to program uh, uh, dense uh, floating point and uh, vector engine uh, in the industry. And, you know, we need it. We need it because you have a traditional supercomputer uh, uh, needs a high performance computing, uh, you know, molecular dynamics and fluid flow analysis. And, uh, you know, think about, uh, you know, the exploration of, of, uh, of the Earth's geography for, uh, for uh, resources. Uh, those are traditional HPC that you see on the right. Uh, and you can see that we're going to be breaking one exaflop next year. In fact, I'll talk in a moment of uh, we're very proud of our role on that. But what you're seeing also is a convergence of traditional supercomputing for uh, HPC with the needs of machine intelligence training. 
uh, it's pretty amazing when uh, you look at what's going on with natural language generation. So, you know, we all think ResNet 50 and, and you know, image uh, uh, um, recognition and, and uh, in, you know, getting a, a correct um, interpretation of those images. But when you look at what uh, is going on with OpenAI and uh, NLG, uh, it's just phenomenal what's going on with a natural language generation. And to get the kind of accuracy you see there, what they're really uh, finding is you actually need supercomputer class computing. Uh, so again, I mentioned uh, that we're on a pace to an exascale. Uh, and uh, you know our role with that uh, is uh, that we are the CPU and the GPU underneath uh, what will be two, the uh, two um, uh, top supercomputers coming out with the US Department of Energy. So it's Oak Ridge National Lab, a one point greater than 1.5 X slot machine, which will be uh, powered up next year. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, in, uh, in 2023, a greater than two exaflop machine in Lawrence Livermore uh, National Labs, not uh, too far uh, from where you're at. So uh, we are uh, very proud with both our CPU and GPU to be partnering with, uh, with Cray, with Hewlett Packard Inter Enterprise, who has acquired Cray uh, and creating these uh, incredibly efficient uh, and, and uh, massive scale supercomputers. Um, also at Lawrence Livermore, uh, uh, you know, uh, labs, uh, we have already running today the Corona system. Uh, it was not named a Corona uh, associated with the pandemic. It was uh, ironically already named a Corona, uh, but uh, we are uh, uh, powering these supercomputers and they are indeed uh, being applied to pandemic uh, research. Uh, and uh, in fact, we've uh, just uh, donated uh, an additional um, uh, 12 petaflops uh, to help further uh, build up this machine, uh, as well as donations we're making across other uh, academic and, uh, and research institutions across the world. Uh, it is a phenomenally uh, challenging time right now, and all of us have to do what we can. In, in industry, uh, we're thinking of what, what you know, any, uh, how, any way we can bring computing uh, to bear and to speed uh, these uh, type of uh, treatment approaches which are being explored. Okay, well, again, I didn't have much time, so I need to wrap. Um, you know, look, keep a culture of innovation. You play your role, uh, you know, use things like Zoom. Uh, I know it's hard when you're not uh, fully on, on campus, uh, but I, I can't say enough about, uh, you know, leaning into your studies and, and uh, you know, really uh, just for wrap saying, uh, it's so exciting what's going on now. There is no barriers. Uh, it is all about innovation and hardware. I, I say it's cooler than ever. Uh, because uh, it is even more about system design, bringing novel uh, hardware and software techniques together. It's going to be heterogeneous. It'll be CPUs, GPUs, specialized uh, accelerators. Uh, so there is so much challenge ahead of you. And just always, if, just be sure you're having fun and that you're learning and you're applying new concepts. And with that, uh, you're, you're going to have just a, a tremendous uh, career ahead of you in whatever you choose. So uh, thank you so much for letting me spend uh, a few minutes with you here today. And I unfortunately have to run, uh, but uh, we've got some of the team that can, can stay with you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Mark. Outstanding, outstanding. Let's, let's, bring, back, let's bring back Bohr into this. Let me do that real fast. Perfect. I'm in, I'm in somewhat. Uh, there, there are a couple of questions. Do you, do you have a second for questions or should we have, should we have? Uh, uh, the others are gonna. Yeah, the other answer that that's no no worries no worries very yeah, good thank uh, you so much mark perfect, had a perfect. 4 30 meeting that's uh, sure. Sure. he's a busy guy <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, to be, I think you guys have a a, a financial report tomorrow or something like that it's kind of important uh, these days um wonderful wonderful uh there are a few questions over here uh i mean one was the directly to Mark, uh, right. but uh, that, that yeah, one. we can't answer that yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> you you, you guys can see these two, right? Yeah, you guys can see I'll these two. I think this is very close but, to. I mean, maybe we can go ahead and introduce uh, Mike and, and and Tom first. Um, yeah, you want me to go first, Tom? Is that? Yeah. Oh, uh, this yeah, is right. Zen three. Yeah. Once you. Once no, you no. Go I was first. gonna. I was gonna introduce myself. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, once you go ahead. Yeah, Mike Clark. I. I uh, graduated from the University of Illinois in 1993. Uh, went to work for AMD on um, the original K5, if anybody has seen that one. It was AMD's first, <laughs> it's 
AMD's first attempt, you know, we were just a second source for Intel chips to the 486. Well, the K5 was our first grounds up design. Um, you know, learned a lot from that, obviously, our first attempt. You know, I like to say, you know, you learn a lot more from your failures and your successes. And, you know, a lot of people may view K5 as a failure, but it was a huge success for the company to push us to get us uh, going and get us to where we are today. Um, since then, I've worked on uh, every, pretty much every CPU, K7, K8, if you've heard of these. Um, they work on the bulldozer line. And um, along the way, I actually got my master's here uh, at the University of Texas. Uh, very painfully one class a semester <laughs> yes i was still working but uh, but yeah and then uh, you know i uh got that in 2003 uh now we're um i was a lead architect on zen and now i actually drive the the whole roadmap uh going forward um so i'll let tom uh, introduce himself all right thanks mike um so my name is tom bird um, i graduated from uc berkeley I did undergrad, master's, and PhD there. So I was there, boy, for over three decades. <laughs> Started at 88 and left at 2001. Um, after tried my hand at doing some independent consulting for a few years, I've been at AMD now 15 years. So uh, when I started AMD on the back end of the Kate family, through the bulldozer family, and then of course now more recently on the Zen family. Um, so. Uh, I can't stress it enough that as much as you kind of hear, oh, the world is where, you know, software is, is where the world's going. Without hardware, that software is useless. And hardware innovation, it's, you know, we, it's become a lot more challenging, which has made it a lot more interesting and really pushes you to think outside the box. Um, you know, going forward, you want to have the nice, smooth CMOS scaling that we skated through with through the 90s and early 2000s. And it's absolutely, um, uh, you know, for years to come, there's going to be enormous challenges in hardware design. All right. You want to take questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I have a question. This is something that happened. Um, uh, so first, um, we are doing uh, 4K videos in this class, and these were snippets of like, you know, 10 minutes uh, or so of, uh, of a chunk of a lecture because we are delivering most of the stuff remotely and we are pre-recording things. So Dan and I got into, you know, this, we are going to do this over a green screen, green screen over PowerPoints um, and all of that. So we are doing this in Adobe Premiere. Um, I tried doing that on a three-year-old laptop and I mean, you know, it gave me an estimate six hours for the first clip or something like that. <laughs> and I got a, a brand new one. Um, Apple Mac with an um, AMD Radeon GPU, you know, the, the, the fastest one that there is. And then suddenly that, that ate the time. I mean, these clips that are 10 minutes long are done in 15 minutes or less. Spectacular. I mean, this is, you know, changed my life. But then Adobe pushed a new update last week. And they went to 20 minutes. <laughs> and I mean, you can't keep up with this kind of stuff. It's uh, software bloat, right? It's software it's bloat slow. somehow. <laughs> I mean, it, it got, you know, apparently it's better and there is many more features, but it is slower. But there was another spectacular thing that happened last night. I started rendering a video. I started, uh, you know, producing this video and the power went out you know, after about one minute. And it finished. It took 30 minutes instead of 20. But it drained my battery. I mean, this was 20% you know, uh, <laughs> of the battery left. Like, oh, what, how do I mean, this is very much um, in the line what Tom was working on. Uh, you know, you can do a lot of things but when you're plugged in, but you have to be very careful uh, how these things are, are, are doing when they're left on their own on, the, on just the battery charge. What can you say about that? I mean, uh, students probably don't know what is happening with dynamic voltage and frequency scaling uh, yet. They might have heard about that, um, but it it obviously is a very big deal nowadays. I mean, we had uh, the AMD had a huge initiative. Um, I from Sam Napsker, I forget the like name of it. Maybe by 20, yeah. twenty-five by twenty that improved performance per watt by a factor of twenty-five times from 2015 to 2020. And I think the final calculation, we came in at about 
I don't know, 25.6 or something like that, that, you know, and absolutely because of that software bloat, um, we're continually pushing, you know, the envelope on uh, power efficiency. And, you know, we'll, we'll continue doing that performance per watt, right? Because if, you know, we come out with a new chip and yet you get 12 hours of battery life, 13 hours of battery life, you say, hey, that's great. I bet you in two years of another few software updates, you'd be down to, you know, four hours or less. So it's a continual battle, um, but absolutely, you know, I mean, you see that in the mobile space and phones, I mean, in all market segments, but Yes, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, I think Mark had alluded to that. That's, uh, I spent a lot of time on the Zen 3 about that to make sure that we could deliver this huge performance uplift. You got to do that while staying within your power budgets. And there's an enormous amount of work and design that has to go into the CPU to support that and the system, and, you know, level as well. It's, it's all levels of the hierarchy. Thanks. Uh, here are some questions. So, um, perhaps this one can go to Mike. Uh, what were some of the biggest challenges that had to be solved in order to develop the Zen 3 CPU? And what are the biggest challenges, roadblocks that AMD needs to overcome to uh, create the next generation of chips? Yeah, so I think, I mean, Tom was kind of getting to it and it really, um, I'm sure you're learning it in your classes too. Uh, I like to talk about, you know, kind of the wheel of performance, you know, there's IPC, there's frequency, uh, there's area, and there's power. And you know, a good architect for each design is trying to balance all those. And then you have software on top of it with uh, security and ISO that you have to take into account as well. So starting with Zen 3, um, kind of what another good property we've learned along the way is that you know, we, we do a grounds up design uh, then, you know, like Zen with 52% IPC, then we did what we call a derivative. You know, along the way as architects, a lot of stuff changes. You know, we get things wrong. We see things we want to fix, but, you know, because of the schedule, they make us, you know, put our pencils down. And we're like, you know, you know how engineers are. They're always like, man, I just wish I could have fixed that. And so we do a derivative and, and then we can get good amounts of uh, you know, performance uplift, 15% IPC on the Zen 2. But for Zen 3, is one of those, we, we've kind of learned we needed to do a whole new grounds up core again. If we are really gonna stay on that line that Mark showed you of, of performance and still keep the perf per watt that Tom was talking about, we have to relook at the whole architecture, you know, uh, come up with a grounds up core and make sure, you know, we effectively use uh, every transistor because uh, as the scaling has slowed down as Tom was hinting and costs are going up, we have to be even more prudent and even better architects to make sure uh, every transistor gets used uh, wisely. So. All right, thanks. Um, here is a, a question uh, that is from Art, but you guys know this. Well, um, how do you see the future of CISC versus specialized risk processors in the world of IoT? Uh, will this be a symbiotic relationship? Perhaps not in the world of IoT, you can think about <laughs> it <laughs> more broadly. Yeah, uh, I can go first and uh, Tom can go as well. I mean, I, you know, interestingly, even though I've only worked on, you know, x86 at AMD for 27 years, uh, you know, to me, ISA is, you know, not, not that big a deal as far as, you know, um, so, you know, we don't, our machine doesn't directly execute x86 instructions, right? We break them up into whatever operations we need. We actually fuse x86 instructions together to get more work done per cycle than what was in the actual original instruction. So we make new CISC instructions in the architecture. We had a couple of CISC into RISC. So I think, uh, I think it is going to be symbiotic. I mean, I think we have um, you know, and it's really more about kind of the, the underlying microarchitecture than the actual ISA uh, on top. So I, I think if you're a good architect, you can design a good uh, CPU in, in any ISA. But we tell them here in, in, in class that uh, the x86 processors are actually risk data paths and there is other stuff that makes it appear like CISC. Is that true? <laughs> I mean, you can think of it that way. There, there is, like I said, we, 
a lot of times you think of it as breaking it down into simpler operations. Um, so, but, you know, again, that's the point. I mean, as, you know, it's not really the ISA, it's the architecture that delivers the performance. Uh, and so I think you'll see, and, and the design point you're trying to hit, right? If, I think that's one of the other challenges we have is trying to use this one microarchitecture to go from those supercomputers down into that laptop and give you not make your battery run out <laughs> in 30 minutes, you know? So it really is the same basic core across those uh, dimensions. You know, we do cut down some things and we obviously don't put in as many cores, but you know, the basic root, uh, what we call the engine is the same in all those devices. Yeah, I'm just going to, to add in that you can go look at architectural. Right. Yeah, I mean, oh, go ahead, Barth. Yeah, uh, it, it finished though in 30 minutes, spectacularly. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> other than the GPU, what are some other hardware accelerators are being developed? <laughs> you want to go for that one, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to what extent I could answer that, but let's just say we, you know, uh, look at the ecosystem around us, and I don't think that there's any things that we've announced. Has there been, Mike? That, but you know, uh, in the high, you know, probably in AMD, of course, but any high tech company, there's going to be a host of of exploration R and D that goes on in you know various side programs a lot of times those are you know quite interesting and challenging things to go off and look at so it's i could say it's on our radar but i probably can't go to too many more details okay um a couple of more uh questions we probably need to, to let you go so what got both of you in the, in, into the world of computer architecture <laughs> yeah that's interesting i mean um my mom uh, was a teacher and um, we actually they actually had an Apple II was a they had like a you know a discount program, uh, and so we got an Apple II computer when I was you know in grade school and just I just loved that thing just playing with it, but you know of course then more software but I, it was just so intriguing to me that I wanted to learn how all the hardware worked inside of it, and so. Um, yeah, that's uh, I, you know, I wanted to be a computer architect <laughs> as a kid. It's it's kind of weird, and to, um, and yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> I guess for me, um, I mean, I there's probably only like one person that might even recognize this, but I remember the ZX80 microcomputer. That's that's really dating me. I know, one of the first ones you could buy for home use, and then Commodore 64 after that. Um, I found like at Berkeley, I think um, like even this class, I would have taken it at a different class, but the one that I found most interesting was probably the closest class is CS152 and going off and building at that time your own Spark uh, CPU core. And then going off and spending grad school at Berkeley, um, did the research project, building an entire ARM8 core, building the infrastructure to go off and do the dynamic voltage scaling. And that was a phenomenal experience, you know, covering all the, the various disciplines um, so that I could take that experience with me, whether it's CAD, whether it's physical design, whether it's RTL architecture. And the more breadth that you get while you're in school, the higher value you will be in hardware design down the road. Because as if you've already heard Mark, you know, hound on that, it's there's so much cross team collaboration that, you know, these huge complicated chips are a team of uh, hundreds of people. And the more that you can talk to people outside your domain and your specific expertise, the more effective you can be to move the whole train forward. So, you know, on a day to day basis, me and Mike do pretty different things, but there's enough overlap in terms of our overall long-term roadmap that we've got semi-regular discussions and forums and that makes it, you know, the very interesting and exciting to keep working in this area. 
I, I met Tom uh, when he was a grad student. I just started as a junior faculty. Uh, one secret, uh, he was the, I think my first uh, dissertation that they signed off as a second reader. Uh, Tom, Bob Brotherson was Tom's, uh, Tom's advisor. Um, but Tom was a one-man microprocessor show. Uh, uh, I mean, he designed, him, you know, with a very little help, a uh, microprocessor from scratch and made it scale its performance with supply voltage, which was the first one of the time. Uh, quickly, just uh, uh, why does AMD use partners uh, like PSNC to manufacture chips instead of making them in-house? I think AMD went through a painful experience of doing that. <laughs> Um, you want to take that one, Mike? Do you want me to? No, I can. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I mean, yeah. I mean, fabricate fabs are really, really expensive. And while well, we did have a CEO who used to say, "Real men have fabs," we uh, he he doesn't say that anymore. <laughs> but uh, but um, yeah, I mean, we you you really you really either because they keep costing so much, um, either need to continue to develop other types of chips to keep filling them and, and sucking in more, you know, things to fill that fab that it's, it's a pretty tough business model. Whereas using TSMC and others who can take multiple customers to leverage uh, the cost of that fabrication facility uh, looks, is, you know, a better economic model uh, for us. All right, one final question and I'll let you go. Uh, what role has grad school played in your career development? And what is some, some thoughts about doing grad school right away after uh, undergrad versus doing it from industry or after uh, spending a few in, years in industry? Yeah, I can go first. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, um, I was broke. <laughs> and I, I always wanted to go to grad school and uh, but I really needed to uh, get a real job and start paying down my student loan debt. Um, so yeah, but then it was a wonderful opportunity AMD here. They had a, a program where they would pay for you to go back to school. Um, and so I put in the effort to put in the you know nights and weekends and we have flexible schedules here to be able to take just one class, spread it out over six years, one class a semester. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I think I believe in, uh, you know, continual learning, uh, the collaboration you get in that environment. Uh, I even, it was 2003 when I graduated, I took a machine learning class, if you can believe it. And, and um, you know, so I, new ideas uh, come from, there are old, old ideas that get better, right, as well as just totally new ideas and just trying to, uh, I think even if you go to grad school, you need to continue to keep, this industry moves so fast, you just have to continue to keep trying to uh, grow your learning and knowledge. Uh, so. yeah. uh, you, you just kept going. Yeah, no, yeah, I would say, I would say keep going, but it's, I would advise doing internships to get some experience in industry to help you understand what you'd want to focus on in grad school. But like, I couldn't imagine, I actually knew some, you know, somebody we work with, uh, you know, went off for his PhD and he was probably in his mid forties. And I don't know if I could mentally, you know, <laughs> handle that, <laughs> tried to do that is in my mid forties. So I think if you're going to go through PhD, I would recommend doing that sooner rather than later. Um, you know, masters, perhaps a little more, you know, flexible, but definitely I wouldn't, I'd highly advise to go do the internships and that's to help you get some exposure to, to the industry. Absolutely. Speaking of that, do you guys hire interns? Uh, can you send me a collection of links if you do? Do you hire people with bachelor's degrees? We have plenty of those. We do. I'll, I, I'll have to send you some links after so you can post for the class. Oh, that, that would be spectacular. <laughs> we, have, we have a few. Um, and somebody just said, yeah, yeah, we have 1,200 people. 1,200 <laughs> people. I'm sure there's a couple of them there who would love to have okay. an hey, Thank you very much. You. Thank uh, you so much, folks. Outstanding. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful to have you here. It was, it was fun yep. to be here. Let's give a hand, folks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Glad we could help out. That's yeah, Mark great. Did, Mark did a great job. His presentation is always. Was that was outstanding. That was very good. Thank you. That was great. All right. Thanks, so folks. All right. Go. All right. All right. Take care.
Take care. All right. All right, folks, let's uh, continue on, have some fun. Uh, I've got the next slide, which is a do it quickie. So we can do this one minute, a slide computing the news. Robot cars without drivers are coming to San Francisco. I think we introduced this, that it was coming to Arizona before, and they're now coming to San Francisco. This is very exciting. Uh, they're going to start neighborhood by neighborhood and try to socialize the idea that, you know, cars are going to be coming around without a driver. Don't freak out. <laughs> the problem is, what if they socialize in this neighborhood, but the person who gets in the car wants to go to that neighborhood and they haven't socialized yet? So what are they going to do, not drop them off or something? But anyway, we'll see what happens. This is a GM product, and we'll see what that works. But I'm very... I'm sure this is going to go viral. You know, there'll be the first, there's going to be somebody who gets in the car and says, ah, and then takes a big picture of the movie and that goes viral. So we'll see how it works, but fingers crossed for safety and fingers crossed for the success of that. That is the future and it's here now. It's here in our city. Very exciting. All right. Uh, I don't know if you can all see this in, if you zoom into this, maybe I should zoom in, zoom mine in a little bit so I can see it better as well. We've got... Uh, you all, many of you are taking the midterm. Uh, I was going to pull up the actual numbers. I had this in another window of the actual numbers, of people who were where they were. Um, we are in still in midterm season, so we're still we're still uh, processing that. Many of you have lost power, so we're going to announce this in the next slide. We've already announced it, but we are uh, we have certainly uh, extended the exam from Sunday and Monday to be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So that's exciting. Uh, so just so you know that that's what that's where we are. We're in the middle of week or the beginning of week ten. Um, the today's lecture is cash is part three, and Wednesday's is cash is part four. The upcoming we also have a lab this week, lab seven. We're going to talk about that. Labs are no longer um, required for points. You attend the session to get those points. But the uh, you don't have to do the lab. So if you can do this, if you can do this lab this week, great. If you need more time, it's no problem. You won't lose points for that. Just show up for your check-in session. It's no longer a check-off. It's a check-in. We have a whole slide talking about that. Um, then on Friday is OS and VM intro. And then next week, we start a whole new topic. Well, it's still related, but it's part of the memory hierarchy. A virtual memory, one and two, and IO is on Friday. Um, so what's still pending, I believe I showed here, is uh, homework seven is due 11.9 and project 3B people are still working on. So we're going to talk about that, but that's just the schedule so you kind of know where we are, but there's nothing officially new assigned here. It's just kind of rollover assignments from before last week's last week's homework seven and lab 3B and project 3B. All right. Them, if, you, if you did not notice, if, uh, we, we moved, uh, we pushed it up uh, due dates for the rest. Correct. Okay. So let's now pull to the next slide here. Um, this is the update, and I'm going to pull the scores up, or at least the numbers here. Here we go. I've got the numbers here. Out of I see probably basically 1,200, because for the quest section one, 12, 1190 took it. So we'll just say 1,200 for for the sake of it. So out of 1,200 who took the quest, I've got about 900 who took section one. 600 who took section two, 720 who took section three, 680 who took section four, and 580 took section five. So roughly, if we're talking about 1,200, about half of you took sections two, four, and five. A little bit more took section three, and 900 out of 1,200, so maybe three quarters-ish, took uh, section one. So people are still taking it, but we do know that there are outages, and we do, you know, wish safety and, uh, for everybody around, and wish safety for all of us, certainly, that we hope no fires spark up because of the high winds. This is a high wind event. As they say, it's the, it's the strongest wind event all year, so pg and &E in, in a preponderance of caution uh, turned power off for many people so that the, the you know, things don't brush into their lines and cause a fire as has happened before. So yeah, here's the idea. My house is without power. I'm, I'm presently in Cory Hall uh, because uh, I have no internet, no cell coverage and no power. Right, and Boris, this is new information that they're actually the cell towers. Are, I thought the cell towers were battery powered or some other power, so that even if you turn power off, you wouldn't lose a cell signal. That kind of worries me for what if power goes out during a big earthquake or something to have no cell phone. I mean, I just think of cell phones as something that automatically always happens. Uh, but that's that's a, that's a significant thing for safety. Every um, fifth or so uh, cell tower has the the the, the, the battery backup. Okay. Okay. Um, so anyway, the exam extended to Tuesday for everybody. So this is it for everybody. We'd love you to take it earlier. So if you still have power, take it now. Don't take it Tuesday. And there's partly a reason for that. And I'll just read this to you. If you didn't take it by then, 
Um, you could just, by the way, if you didn't take it by the end of Tuesday, you say, oh, something happened, something happened, something happened. We'll just put you in the pool of re midterm retake students. And that's going to be 11, 7, 11, 8. That's going to be after the election. So we're not making you do anything between now and the election because of so many things are going on. We're going to send out a form for you and figure that, that out. Um, we are going to have, we had to now scramble and get TA proctoring for people who had the exam on Tuesday because we didn't plan for exam, a Tuesday exam day. Um, and uh, we're still working on th that schedule and trying to have people put, pull extra, extra hours, but you know, we're really stretching our staff thin. We were gonna have them all signed up to do this. And now you, you still have somebody manning the store on Monday, but now they have to man the store on Tuesday also. So like they're gonna be half, they're gonna be, their workload is less on Monday and, and, and now they're stretching into two, two days. We'd rather it just be, you work a certain shift and you, you know, answer questions as fast as you can. Now the questions are gonna come much slower because people, fewer people take you out on Monday and now they have to also work double time. So it's kind of a shame that we have to push our staff to do this, but we're working with you and we're working with them and they're, they're also dealing with the same thing. They're also students themselves. Um, so please take it today if you can. If you don't have any power issues, take it today because we don't have a lot of people tomorrow. Just letting you know that. And Piazza is gonna remain closed for Tuesday. Okay, so that's awesome. So if you finished your exam, you wanna work on the thing and ask questions, you could ask a private question, but we're focusing and prioritizing all the questions for the exam, just so you know, no, for one more day, just one more day. We can't slip anymore. Project 3B, we have extended it to 11-1. So this is Monday, 11-1. I think 11-2 is the Tuesday or is 11-3? Maybe it's Sunday. Let me make sure I get the date right. Uh, Sunday, 11-1, okay? We get, that's two extra days, which means we only actually moved, we only actually stole one day for you in terms of Piazza being closed and all this, but we actually give you two extra days. So that accompanies, you know, that is able to react to maybe you need two days of extra. So we're actually giving two days because people may have actually lost power for two days. Piazza is going to be closed Tuesday, so you can ask questions, but we're going to, oh, this is very important. We're going to open up a Project 3B text channel on Discord, but TAs are prioritizing midterm monitoring over project support on Tuesday, because that's really the most important thing. That's a much higher stakes. You know, it's like a huge chunk of your total course points is the exam. A much higher, a smaller chunk is Project 3B. So we need to focus on that part of it. You are not allowed to discuss the midterm on Discord. If you do, we will consider that cheating. Maybe somebody's out here and looking at Discord to get answers. We don't want any of that happen. So if you discuss it on, on Discord, we are, we are going to pull your name. We're sending you off a student contact. You cannot do this. You cannot discuss the exam anywhere, period, on any channel, period, until Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time, okay? That's the rule. So make sure you don't do that. Don't get in trouble for that. Make sure you don't think, oh, I didn't know. I can tell you. No, you can't do that, okay? That's a bad thing. All right. Here is some more miscellaneous policies. Just to clarify, I know we're running a little bit over, but we're going to clarify these miscellaneous policies, and then we'll be able to take any questions after this. The Quest retake is hopefully happening this week. That's a much lower priority. It's like 5% of your whole grade. So we kind of haven't prioritized that. We're really prioritizing making sure we beta test the midterm and launch that's worth much more. So that's what took over our, all of our kind of circle of inner circle of TAs who normally would do the auto graders for the Quest and also beta testing the midterm. They were all focusing on the midterm to make sure we delivered, I thought, a very good product. I hope the midterm... We, we've heard, we heard some initial feedback, which is people were very pleased with the midterm. Um, what the numbers are showing, by the way, the mean, mean numbers is they're showing, I'll just show the first question, you know, you have an hour, the average is about 23 minutes. Remember, I'm not telling you, this is not information. The, the C part, the quest caliber is two hours you have, the average is about one hour. We kind of thought that was be right. So that's about, that's good. Midterm three is risk assembly. We thought it would be about 30 minutes or 40 minutes. The average is about 45 minutes. Section four STS, the, we have an hour. The average is about 25 minutes. And section five is 35 minutes, even though you have an hour. So people are mean is well below the number. No, you know, when the mean starts to creep up to the limit, we're like, oh no, people are having to cut it up before the end. Actually, we're, we're doing very well with that. So I think the overall, for out of all these times, ends up being about two hours and 20 or something. So that's not, I told you two to three hours and the mean is showing it to be that. So I'm very, very pleased that the, the exam is doing well. We're hoping to get the midterm grading by next week. There's, you know, there's a lot to do it. We have to do it right. And we have to make sure we cover all the cases so we don't have a lot of those iterations of, please do a regrade of it. We want to try to get it right the first time. So we're going to spend a little bit more time doing that. That probably is going to happen by next week. So they're very focusing on the quest retake this week. And we have to rewrite the midterm for the midterm retake also. So we've got to, we're doing a lot, folks. It's much more than we used to do. We used to just write an exam and be done. And we all, you know, there's a couple of grade scopey small things. No, there's like four exams for every exam now. So it's a lot harder than it used to be. To be. 
Um, but hopefully that's working well for, for folks who are remote and able to do this. Lab check. We want to clarify what a lab check-in is called. Before they were called lab check-offs, where you got points for being there for answering technical questions. Okay. This is just clarifying. This is no new information. This is just telling you what we really meant, if you didn't know that. So the lab completion is no longer mandatory. So that you don't have to finish the lab. If you, you want to, it's out there, but it's just a resource for you to use and it's going to be tested. So we recommend you do that, but we're not going to push you on it because we're not going to put all these things. So if you need to do it RRR week, that's fine. Not optimal because you probably need them for homeworks and, and projects, but you can do that and you don't lose any points for that. The check-ins, again, previously known as check-offs, are still mandatory. You still need to come to check-ins every week. And again, that can, and this is driven by you. You drive what you want to talk about. You have to come and have a time where you have like an appointment and you have to make that time. If you don't, you'll get points for that week. There's no do that the week after, the week after. No, you have to come that week. If you miss it, you don't lose, you lose points for that one. And all it is, is a chance for you to have a face-to-face -face time with a staff member. And what that means is if you need to just talk or vent or cry or get help or get a technical question, anything you want, we're here for you. We're here to support you. And our staff knows about resources to direct you to for either technical or social emotional support. If you say, you know what, I'm feeling okay. Ask me the lab. And I did the lab. Ask me lab questions. Then we're ready with those. We're already ready with those lab questions and the checkoff question to do. There's no points for getting them right. You just help. And that's kind of a chance for you to have a little one-on-one -on -one with, the, with, with the staff member. Okay. We got them. We got those. And those are great. So we have them ready. And as much as possible, we're going to have the labs have auto grading components to them. That's again, just kind of a free thing for you to practice your stuff, not for any points, but we'll, you know, if, if you can auto grade rather than use up a person's time, do that one. So we'll hopefully have as much as that. And we've moved homework seven that was there. So now they're due, we, we slid it back, but we, we got to have it, you know, at some point it has to stop because we have an exam at the end and it, back, it, back, it backs up, obviously, like it backs up like a, like a sick drain does. So homework seven is now due the same day as homework eight, which means that's 11, nine. So, you know, two weeks in the future, two and a half weeks in the future, we've got some homeworks due and they're out there. And by the way, don't forget, you can work in teams on your homeworks. So get your teams together and support each other and work together on homeworks. And we love that. That's just wonderful. Okay, good stuff. Um, I believe you still have to submit them independently, right? You work together and whatever you create, you can create, they'll be identical. You and your partner have identical projects, identical homework assignments, but you need to submit them in Gradescope together. There's no way in Gradescope for you to indicate who your partner was. That's what we're saying. So in Gradescope, it's treating you as a one-on-one -on -one person, but you can be an identical solution. Just make sure you have your, your partner's name on your solution. Whew, I'm done. Bor, anything to add? Um, yeah, get going with these homeworks as soon as you have time, um, because they, both of them do have a bit of a work. Um, right. you know, they're like two-hour homeworks. Yeah, finish 3B first, obviously. You know, finish your midterm first, yeah. then take a, take a day to breathe, breath and, to breathe and rest. Then jump in on that Project 3B, finish that up. You have till Sunday, so that's good. We give you some more time. Hopefully, that's okay. Then take a breath and then jump back in in your homework. So hopefully that's okay. And then farther, farther afield is waiting for you, which is going to be fun. And hopefully you enjoy this one. I'm going to give lectures after Bora talks and does his VM and IO lecture. My lectures are on going to be thread level parallelism, how to make how to make use of those multiple cores. Finally, you're going to learn how to do this class. Exciting. We'll teach you that. And then you'll have a project for to jump on that. So it should be really fun. People really have enjoyed the parallelism. That should be good stuff. Okay. Phew. They're, oh, they're right. About appointments. Um, I think they're closed now, but we got to open them. Uh, so I'll remind the PA. That's so. right. Yeah, I think that's right on the appointments. Okay. Good stuff. Yeah, we got to open them so people can sign up. Okay. And we've got still about 58 people here. Anybody else? Anybody else want to share some stuff? It's ex it's an exciting weekend. We, we wish most of our, we wish everybody safety. You know, that's the most important thing with all of the, if if they say to evacuate, you should be evacuating folks. A lot of people in the in the Berkeley Hills, I'm not sure how many students live in the Berkeley Hills, but please listen to them when they say to evacuate, or even if, they, even if they're voluntary, not mandatory, please think about that for safety reasons, because that can be scary. The Berkeley Hills have had major, major fires in the past. And if you live up in the hills, I don't know how many people renting houses up in the hills, but the, I used to live up there. I, before, I would tell you, I live across the street from where the Oakland fire was, across the street from the Oakland fire. Uh, and it was a, a terrible loss of life. So please don't, don't, don't do that. And I understand that Irvine is on fire right now, and I'm so sorry that folks are, are suffering that. But I think that that's, that's a challenge. We had fires up, up in Napa recently in Sonoma. Um, and please do reach out if you're having troubles with this. We certainly have extensions. And by the way, just to remind you, we have an incomplete for anybody who needs it. And I will give you an update. I just will give you some numbers update. 
Uh, I see that eight students have taken advantage of that, and that's eight students who are now breathing a little bit easier, now realizing that's off, off their shoulders. If, if you need it, we're here for you. So grab that in, incomplete. It's a pre-approved incomplete. I, don't, I know of no other class is giving this. We are giving it to support you if you need it. You guys, are, you guys, are, uh, you guys have that support, okay? And, and don't feel bad about that. You, you, yeah, you, don't feel guilty. It's not like, oh, I do it. I feel guilty. Like we're looking down on you. That's no problem. If you have it, just pull the ripcord and we got it there for you. No problem, folks. We're there to support you. Next semester. That's fine. Order semester. Yeah, no big deal. No big deal. Good uh, stuff. Okay. All uh, right. I think we're good. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, seeing I'm not I'll seeing get questions. power at some point. I, I need to record the next four lectures. <laughs> <laughs> Bo, Bo's going to be in his Corey office with his books. Hi, I'm in my office. I'm recording a lecture. Yeah, virtual memory. <laughs> Enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> virtual this office. Is not trivial. This is not trivial. I got to tell you. And by the way, thank you so much for Bora for great inviting those guests. I want to give Bora credit for this. He's been mostly the one handling and making the relationships with all the guests. So I want to thank Bora for doing a great job with our reaching out to so many. But by the way, this has never happened before, and this is a great gift to the class. So I want to thank you what you've done for the for the students. And I, we 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 try to get these guys to 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 stay and pay attention to us as well, right? I mean, you guys are working hard. I do want to make sure that you're connected to to jobs um, yep, and definitely and so stuff like that. And Andy is supposedly doing really well. We'll find out tomorrow how well they're doing. <laughs> is the earnings report? Yeah. That's what Paper Master is working on now. I mean, I'm sure. You know, the only last minute people. I, I, I guess that's yeah, right. to be right. not, uh, as well. But look, Bora, I've been around Berkeley since 1990. That's 30 years. I have never seen an undergraduate course that had this powerhouse array of speakers in the history. 30 years. I've never seen it happen. I know about you too. Never. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, that, that, that's the idea. I mean, this semester nominally sucks. <laughs> it's online. Right. At the very, very least, least, grab somebody. <laughs> yeah. We can bring people who there is no way that, you know, that they right. would be become like Victoria Coleman or, or uh, Mark Papermaster. Right. Or right. Mitchell. No way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this All is right. good stuff. Good stuff. And DARPA, come on, forget, don't forget DARPA, folks. <laughs> it's DARPA project, DARPA lead here. All right, folks. Good all to right. see you all. Stay safe, everybody. Do your midterm today if you can. Don't push us tomorrow because we don't have a lot of staff to support this. So do a midterm today. Good skill to all of you. Knock it out of the park. Hopefully, you guys are going to enjoy that. Take care, folks. Thanks again. Bye. Okay. All right. Bye. Yay. Thanks, Franklin. Good stuff.